Dr. Paul Kengor is a professor of political science at Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania, where he also serves as executive director of the Center for Vision and Values, which is a think tank based at the college. He is a nationally recognized authority on, among other things, Ronald Reagan, communism, and the Cold War. He writes for numerous national publications and is seen on all the national talk shows. He has written a number of books and shameless plug warning, he will be in the lobby selling his current book after he speaks. It's called The 11 Principles of a Reagan Conservative. And as we prepare for our luncheon speaker, the son of President Ronald Reagan, we thought it appropriate to end this segment of the conference by having Dr. Paul Kanger come up and talk to us about what it really means to be a Reagan conservative. Paul? Thank you, Loman. It's great to be here. And uh, Loman, all that you do, Fred Anton, uh, Dave Taylor, it's just a, a great event. I mean, it's, I always tell people it's the Pennsylvania version of CPAC, and uh, it re really is. It's a fabulous thing. All right, so today I'm going to talk to you about 11 principles of a Reagan conservative, and I've got about 25 minutes to do that, which leaves me about two minutes per principle, so I better, uh, better skip any jokes and just, just get, get right to it. But I won't, I won't, cover, I won't cover all 11, but, but I'll, I'll go through a few. Let me ask a, a show of hands here. How many people here consider themselves a Reagan conservative? Right? Okay. All right. You, you hear that constantly. Every Republican who wants to be president calls himself or herself a Reagan conservative. And, uh, and why wouldn't you want to when, when Reagan won 44 out of 50 states in 1980 and 49 out of 50 in 1984? But, uh, but, but so what, what is a conservative? What, what is a Reagan conservative? Well, Ronald Reagan... Gave, uh, gave a definition of sorts. He, he tried to stay away from giving a hard and fast definition because that immediately opens you to all kinds of criticism, especially from pointy-headed, nitpicky academics like myself and, and, and others. But, but, but Reagan gave a speech at CPAC. Reagan spoke at CPAC 13 times between 1974 and 1988. 1974 was the first year of CPAC. In fact, I spoke at CPAC a few weeks ago, and there was, I don't know, Loman, maybe 5,000 people, something like that at CPAC. And they, they said when Reagan spoke there in 74, there were maybe 100 people at, at that time. But Reagan spoke there every year uh, while he was president, 1981 through 1989. And Reagan, February 1977, so he gives this speech. It's his 66th birthday. It was February 6, 1977. And he said there, conservatism means different things to those who call themselves conservative. All right, but Reagan, you know, Reagan was the essence of a, of a complete conservative. And so here's the definition that he gave. Conservatives uh, believe in the common sense and common decency of ordinary men and women working out their own lives in their own way. This is the heart of American conservatism today. I mean, Americans aim to conserve. Conservatives aim, conservatives aim, to, aim to conserve, to preserve and conserve. Conservative wisdom and principles, said Reagan, are derived from a willingness to learn, not just from what is going on now, but from what has happened before, right? What has happened before? G.K. Chesterton called that the, the, the democracy of the dead that your ancestors should have a say in what you do going forward. You, you can learn from your ancestors. Not everything that happened in the past is useless. Most of it is useful. And it doesn't mean that everything that your ancestors did in the past was right, right? But there are time-tested ideals from the past that we've learned through time and through experience work. So Reagan continued, the principles of conservatism are sound because they are based on what men and women have discovered through experience in not just one generation or a dozen, but in all the combined experience of mankind. When we conservatives say that we know something about political affairs 
and that what we know can be stated as principles, we are saying that the principles that we hold dear are those that have been founded through experience to be ultimately beneficial for individuals, for families, for communities, and for nations found through the often bitter testing of pain or sacrifice and sorrow. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, the guys who were just up here talking about how big of an issue same-sex marriage is, especially to, to younger folks. And I often get from younger crowds, they'll, they'll say to me, how does a conservative communicate the conservative position uh, against same-sex marriage without sounding cruel and heartless and against freedom? I said, well, just, just give them the definition of conservatism. I mean, if you understand what conservatives believe, that you know, we believe in natural law, biblical values, time-tested values and ideals that have preserved over millennia, over, over multiple centuries. Conservatives conserve. You wouldn't expect a conservative to suddenly jump on board to redefine marriage uh, in, in a way that, right? I mean, so if you, if you just understand where they're coming from, conservatives, a liberal ought to say, well, they're conservatives, and so they believe this and this. Well, you shouldn't expect them to, to, to support redefining marriage, uh, right? I mean, that just, that's not a time-tested value. You would expect a progressive who's always evolving, changing, reforming. In fact, they don't even know what they're reforming to. They just know that they're changing. They're always evolving. 20 years ago, 1993, 1994, the entirety of the Democratic Party, both Clintons and, the, and, and liberalism, was, was on board for the Defense of Marriage Act, defining marriage as between one man and one woman. And now, 20 years later, they've all completely flipped. And then they say to conservatives, they call the conservatives radicals and extremists, when all we're doing is supporting what we've supported for thousands of years, right? It's, it's really a bizarre situation. But, but to go, a conservative would say, wait a second, you want to suddenly go redefine this according to biblical and natural law with, as one of the justices on the Supreme Court said, with a concept that's not even as old as the cell phone. That, that ain't no time-tested value. Can, can, we, can we back off a little bit first be, before we go and do that? That's what a progressive would do. That's not what a conservative would do. Reagan told CPAC in 1977, he believed the old lines, once dividing social and economic conservatives, were disappearing. And he said that the time had come to present a program of action on political principle that it can attract those from the so-called social issues and those from the so-called economic issues. Isn't it time, he said, when we combine the two major segments of contemporary American conservatism into one politically effective whole? And, and Reagan was that. He was both an economic and a social conservative. He, he wanted both of those. All right. So as Lohman said in, in the book, I lay out 11 principles of a Reagan conservative. And, uh, and here they are. You got your, got your pens ready? You ready to write fast? I'm not going to go through them. And, and uh, there's a cheat sheet in the book outside that I could sign later if you're, if you're, interested, in, if you're interested in that. Freedom, faith, family. Sanctity and dignity of human life. Remember, I'm a professor, so I'm going to, I'm going to grade you on this. You've got to make, make, make sure you get this. American exceptionalism, the founders' wisdom and values, lower taxes, limited government, peace through strength. Some lessons on that right now regarding Vladimir Putin and the Ukraine that we're not following. Anti-communism and belief in the individual. So here, today I can't go through all 11, but I want to go through four of these. Uh, if I have time, lower taxes, limited government, American exceptionalism, and belief in the individual. You'll see here both economic and social conservatism. And you'll also see here this list, these 11, after I really stopped and put them all together. So this is not only a list of Reagan conservatism and conservatism, but this is really kind of the anti-Obama, the anti-progressive list. I mean, the contrast with what progressives believe is, is so crystal clear. All right, so the first of these, lower taxes. From a modern policy perspective, and probably the most relevant and continual application of Reagan conservatism is that conservatives should be against higher taxes. Uh, I mean, lower taxes is what a conservative would want. 
High taxes provides the mother's milk that feeds and sustains big government and the growth in government. All right, they, they should be you know, excessively high taxes simply ought to be resisted. And Reagan in particular was bothered by the progressive income tax. Now the progressive income tax was begun, anyone know when? What year? Great group, 1913, 100th anniversary, just, uh, just la last year. I recently heard uh, an MSNBC program where Lawrence O'Donnell was interviewing Howard Dean and they were talking about the progressive income tax as if it had been chiseled into stone tablets of the Constitutional Convention. Right, like this, this is what the founders believed. You know, this, is what, this is what governments do, said, said Howard Dean. They redistribute income. This is, this is what they do. That's exactly what he said. But, but somehow we go from 1776 to 1913 without a permanent graduated progressive federal income tax. So it's signed that year, February 1913, passed by Congress, signed into law by which president? Woodrow Wilson. Requires an amendment to the Constitution, right? In order for that to happen. Which amendment? 16th, right? In 1913, when the progressive income tax was put in place, and this was a knockdown drag out, just to, just, just to establish the idea, in principle, this here's a lesson that conservatives understand. Once you establish in principle the idea that the federal government can put in place a permanent federal income tax to tax your income and redistribute it, look out. And the progressives back then said, well, we, we just want a tiny little percentage on the very wealthiest Americans, right? Just, just a little bit, you know, just, just, just a little bit here. And there were people back then, I guess you would have called them conservatives, saying the power to tax is the power to destroy. You don't know what you're getting into. Maybe they did know what they were getting into. So 1913, the top rate was 7%, applied to incomes of over $500,000 a year, and 1913 dollars, over $500,000 a year. By the time Woodrow Wilson left office in 1921, that 7% rate was 73%. Now liberals will say, well, World War I, okay, uh, but World War I was 1914 to 1918. America didn't get into it until 1917. Didn't really start sending troops at all until the end of that year. And then it was over in November. Should, shouldn't it have started to come back down again? It didn't. It continued to, to increase. Wilson wanted that money for his so-called robust administrative state. 73%, what did it do? It only continued to go up. Under Franklin Roosevelt, it went up to 94%. 94%. Read Bert Folsom's book on this. FDR wanted to take the upper rate to 99.5% on incomes over $100,000 a year. 99.5% on incomes over $100,000 a year. Now, there was an FDR Democrat named Ronald Reagan who was an actor. And everyone called him a B-movie actor. Well, you know, Humphrey Bogart and John Wayne made some B-movies too. But Reagan made movies with Errol Flynn, Olivia de Havilland. And at one point, he was one of the top five box office draws at Warner Brothers. Reagan was doing very well. And Reagan learned that once he hit that 94% tax bracket, it was time to quit making movies. And back in those days, you know, they made multiple movies per year. And Reagan learned that his decision not to do those extra movies, they didn't hurt Reagan because Reagan was a rich guy. But, but it hurt the custodians, the people at the Warner Brothers lot, the cafeteria ladies, the grips, the people, the people who, put the who worked on, st on the stages. Uh, I mean, that's, that's who was really effective. A rich guy was fine, but, but, it, but it hurt everybody else. Reagan also said that the progressive income tax was right out of out of uh, Marx's Communist Manifesto. The first time that I read that Reagan said that, I thought, well, I don't know, that might be a little overboard, right out of Marx's Communist Manifesto. Not if you've actually read Marx's Communist Manifesto. The guys who were just up here talking about college professors, I, I often get asked by Young America's Foundation to go around the country and give a talk at colleges called Why Communism is Bad. 
I don't have to give that at Grove City College. That's my ongoing talk at, at Grove City College. But, but, but I'll get invited, these, these just frustrated students, who say, please come here. My professor literally has a bust of Marx on his table. And, and could you please come and, and give this talk? I won't say, but I went to one college in Pennsylvania. And there are, when I give this talk, there's never any professors there. Never, never. This time, there was one professor who came. And I thought, oh, is this guy going to heckle me, give me a hard time? He came up after, and he explained to me that he was literally the only Republican out of a faculty of about 130 at this college that he knew of. And he was a Polish immigrant who had worked with the Solidarity Movement in the 1980s. So he, he, was, he was an anti-communist. But com uh, I always tell these students, these students will say, my professor, the, some of the students will say, yeah, but the Communist Manifesto is a really pretty good book if you just read it, right? I mean, it talks about sharing and so forth. I know right away that they haven't actually read the book. I mean, Marx says in the Communist Manifesto, the, the entire communist program may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. It says abolition of private property. You know, my my five-year-old can tell you that if, you, if you're going to try to abolish private property, you're going to have to kill people. Period. Right? You're, you're, you're simply going to... And Marx says in the, in the manifesto, well, of course, des despotic inroads will be necessary. Of course. Yeah, of course. You're going to have to kill people to take their private property. So there's a 10-point plan in Marx's man manifesto. And one of these, right after abolition of private property, is a graduated progressive income tax, right along with abolishing all rights of inheritance, which you can also do if you have an inheritance tax that takes away taxes inheritance at 100%. So when Reagan became president, he decided to do something about this. August 13, 1981, the upper income rate had been reduced to 70% under John Kennedy. Reagan took it down to 28% to 28%. He cut taxes across the board on all incomes. And also when Reagan started, there were 16 separate federal income tax tax brackets. And when he was done, there were two, 28% and 15%. And an entire category of poor Americans weren't taxed at all. You'll often hear liberals say, well, when are you going to cut the, cut the taxes on the poor? Well, the poor don't pay federal income tax if they're at a certain level. Right, if they're below fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year, whatever it is currently. So with um, Reagan, liberals will sometimes say, "Well, Reagan did increase some taxes. He increased taxes on gasoline and an excise tax here, a payroll tax there." By the way, he did it three or four times. In one, in one of the cases, he did it in an agreement with liberals that they would give him three dollars in spending cuts for every dollar in tax increases, and they betrayed that agreement. Reagan said it was one of the biggest mistakes that, that he ever made. But Reagan never budged on cutting marginal income tax rates. Now stop and compare this to Barack Obama. When Obama got in, and Reagan got that passed, the August 13th, 1981 tax cuts, with, uh, with a Democratic Congress, right? Working with, with a Democratic Congress. Washington Post called it one of the most impressive bipartisan triumphs in, in presidential history. Obama got in, called his, you know, the Republicans who wanted to cut taxes, called them hostage takers, denigrated them. You know, Reagan worked across the aisle and got this tax cut done. What Reagan did here was effectively a form of private sector stimulus, right? Come out of a recession. The, the recession that Obama has, the 2009, 2010, was the, was the worst recession since the one Reagan inherited in 1981. Obama responds with an $800 billion stimulus package, which is basically what? Private se or public sector government stimulus. Reagan said the better thing to do is let Americans keep more of their own money, let them spend that and invest it, and let them grow the economy. That's the best way. That's the better way. You can see the difference in the results. With Obama right now, we have you know, chronic unemployment, 47 million people on food stamps. It's unbelievable. 47 million people on food stamps. Under Reagan, the number of people on food stamps when Reagan left office was 18 million. So it was you know, two, twice a third 
of what, of what it is under Obama. The results of Reagan's tax cuts, 92 consecutive months of economic growth that far surpassed the previous record of 58 months, chronic unemployment, deadly combination of double-digit inflation, interest rates, the so-called malaise misery index vanquished, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, get this, which in real terms had declined by 70% from 1967 to 1982, tripled from 1983 to 1989. The telecom computer industries began their ultimate explosion in the 1990s. Consider these numbers. Contrary to liberal demonology, all right, the numbers on minorities under Ronald Reagan, Real income for a median African-American family had dropped by 11% from 1977 to 1982. From 82 to 89, coming out of the recession and after the tax cuts, it rose by 17% under Reagan. In the 1980s, there was a 40% jump in the number of African-American households earning $50,000 a year or more. Think about that. African-American unemployment, which has increased significantly under Obama, fell faster than white unemployment in the 1980s. The number of black-owned businesses under Reagan increased by 40%, while the number of blacks who enrolled in college under Reagan increased by 30%, compared to a 6% increase for whites. Similar numbers for Hispanics, if not higher, increases in family income, employment, college enrollment. The number of Hispanic-owned businesses in the 1980s grew by 81%, which is about the number of Hispanics who voted for Obama in 2012. And the number of Hispanics enrolled in college jumped by 45%. The income gap between men and women under Reagan, it went from women earning 60 cents per dollar for uh, every man to 71 cents. And the number of women enrolled in college outpaced males in the 1980s for the first time. Remember the homeless under Reagan? Older folks, right? Remember how Dan Rather every night, CBS News, would have his regular homeless update? Remember Mitch Snyder in Washington? said there were you know, three, six, 10, 20, 100 million people homeless. You know, homeless stacked like cordwood. All across, you know, six million homeless in Chicago. There aren't, there aren't even six million people in Chicago. Um, I, I, I don't think. Or not, not, uh, but they did a study on this in the 1980s. And Housing and Urban Development, HUD did a study. And they found that um, halfway through the Reagan term, or the Reagan eight years, 1984, that the number was probably around 300,000 homeless under Reagan, probably around 300,000. Under Obama, four years into Obama's presidency, 636,000 homeless. And did any of you hear anything at all during the election campaign from the media about the number of homeless under Obama? Nothing. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, hear, I didn't hear anything at all, not even close. All right, so the Reagan tax cuts, the Reagan tax cuts spurred that, spurred that, that, that economic growth. All right, another principle here. I'll go faster on these ones. Uh, limited government, a conservative, a Reagan conservative, this is an important thing for conservatives to understand, for liberals to understand about us as well. I wrote this book in part, I want liberals to read this just to understand what we really believe because they caricature everything that we, that we believe. Um, a conservative is not anti-government. A conservative is anti-big government, anti-excessive government, anti-overly regulated government, anti-nanny state, cradle to grave, womb to tomb government. I mean, a conservative believes that government has a role in, in restoring order, in providing core, certain core functions to the economy. Ronald Reagan said in his inaugural address, 1981, which he wrote entirely himself, they said Reagan was an idiot, Reagan wrote his entire inaugural address in his own hand. They have it now at the Reagan Library. You can look at the whole thing. It's all handwritten out. The presidents don't write their inaugural addresses. Reagan actually wrote the whole thing. Reagan said in that address, it's not my intention to do away with government. 
He also said that outside of its core functions, and think about this because I think that this is right on, outside of its core functions, government does few things as well or as better as the private sector of the economy, which means that the pr things for the private sector ought to be left to the private sector. Jonah Goldberg last night talking about federalism. Reagan had been a governor at one point. There are certain things that should be done at the local level, whether public or private. You shouldn't be on this constant progressive push to push everything to Washington, to the federal government, to, to the collective. Reagan said the more and more you do this, you just say, well, yeah, the government can do that. That's okay. Uh, sure, maybe the government ought to do that too. That's a good thing for the government to do. Eh, maybe this too. Reagan said that's creeping socialism. And before you know it, you've got this massive government where you have to increase taxes to pay for it. And then the tax rates become so high and so punitive that it starts to hurt the economy. And then you don't get the prosperity that you need to be, to be able to produce, produce the revenue for the government in the first place. Right? And then liberals get to this point where well, we have to have 50% tax rates. We've got to pay for all this stuff. Pay for all the stuff that they created and that they wanted the federal government doing to begin with. A couple of other principles. American exceptionalism. If you look in the, in the dictionary under the words American exceptionalism, they had to just have a picture of Ronald Reagan right, right next to that. Barack Obama was asked a few years ago if he believed in American exceptionalism. And you remember what he said? He said, well, well, sure, I believe in American exceptionalism, just like uh, the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism, the British believed in British exceptionalism. But, but that's not exceptionalism. If everybody's exceptional, then no one's exceptional. Reagan thought that there was something exceptionally special about America, unique about us, unique to us, which drew people from all over the world to this country. He said, he called America a shining city. He said in a speech I found in 1952 that he gave to this tiny little women's college in, in, in Missouri. Reagan said, America is less of a place than an idea. Think about that, right? Write that one down, you got that? America is less of a place than an idea. It really is. In his farewell address, Reagan talked about uh, the last few days and uh, last few days of his presidency, growing increasingly pensive as he's thinking about his eight years in the Oval Office. And he was thinking about looking out the window of the Oval Office. And he said, I've been reflecting on what the past eight years have meant and what they mean. And the image that comes to mind like a refrain is a nautical one. It's a small story about a big ship and a refugee and a sailor. It was the 1980s, early 1980s, at the height of the boat people. These were the Vietnamese boat people, right? And there was a sailor who was hard at work, a U.S. sailor on the carrier Midway, which was patrolling the South China Sea. The crew spied on the horizon a leaky little boat. These were the people from Vietnam who were escaping after it went communist, after we left in 1975. Like Cuban boat people, others trying to get away from communism, their ultimate goal is to go to America. It's not to go to Greece, by the way, okay? It's, 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 it's to go to America. Said Reagan, and crammed inside were refugees from Indochina hoping to get to America. The Midway sent a small launch to bring them to the ship in safety. As the refugees made their ways through the choppy seas, one spied the sailor on deck, and one of the refugees stood up and called out to him. And what did he say? What did, what did this boat person say? He yelled, hello, American sailor. Hello, freedom man. Hello, American sailor. Hello, freedom man. And at, and, and at that moment, I mean, that Vietnamese boat person He's looking at this person not as a sailor, not as a military. He doesn't say, hi, Navy guy, right? Hello, military person. Hello, American. Hello, American sailor. Hello, freedom man. He saw the American sailor as, as freedom man. This boat person in the, minds of Ronald, in the mind of Ronald Reagan was like a spokesperson. He was a spokesperson for an exceptional America. And so was Reagan. Reagan was, Reagan was as well. Reagan said, a small moment with a big meaning, 
A moment the sailor who wrote it in a letter couldn't get out of his mind, and when I saw it, neither could I, because that's what it was to be an American again in the 1980s. We stood again for freedom. We stood again for freedom. All right, one more here. One more principle. Belief in the individual and sanctity and dignity of human life. Ronald Reagan said that the first and most fundamental of all human freedoms is the right to life. He said, without the right to life, there can be no other freedoms. That one has to come first. Without that right, no other rights have meaning. If you don't have a right to life, then you can't have freedom of speech, press, assembly, religion, anything else. That one comes first. Reagan actually favored a human life amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which, if it had succeeded, would, would have put into the Constitution these words, the paramount right to life is vested in each human being from the moment of fertilization without regard to age, health, or condition of dependency. If they had succeeded in putting that in, Barack Obama's HHS mandate would be dead. It would have flat out from the very beginning violated the Constitution. Of course, then again, would that have mattered, right? It would have violated the Constitution. But, but for Reagan, this belief in the sanctity and dignity of human life goes back to when, when he was a lifeguard at the Rock River in Dixon, Illinois, 1920s, when Ronald Reagan, from the ages of 15 to 22, for seven years, for seven summers, saved the lives of 77 people as a lifeguard, as a young boy patrolling the Rock River in Dixon, Illinois. Bill Clark, who was Reagan's closest advisor, I became Clark's biographer, said that he believes that Reagan's respect for the sanctity and dignity of human life really began back then. Reagan said, every human being, and on this he quoted uh, Father Theodore Hesburgh of Notre Dame, the president of Notre Dame. When Reagan was president, the Notre Dame president invited Reagan to give the commencement address. Um, the new Notre Dame president invited Obama to give the commencement address in Obama's first year. But Reagan quoted Father Theodore Hesburg, who said, every person is a race sacra. This is Latin. Um, got the pencils, right? R-E-S and then sacra, race sacra, which means sacred reality. Reagan said that in a speech in Atlanta in, in 1983. Every person is a sacred reality. Reagan argued that, and compare this to the progressive vision, Every individual is more important than the state. Why? Because, it, because individuals have souls, which makes individuals eternal. States are not eternal. States come and go. And for a state, especially an atheistic communist one, to do anything to try to keep the individual from, from achieving his or her soul, from believing in God, is the ultimate abomination. The individual is incomparably more important than, than the state. Reagan, again and again and again, spoke of the individual, the paramount importance of the individual. Now, one contrast here with, with Obama, Obama uses the word collective all the time, constantly. I'm going to do a content analysis at some point and try to count the number of times that Obama has used the word collective in what different forms in, in, his, in his presidential speeches. It's all through dreams from my father, all through it. Talks about what we can do collectively, collectively, to write our children's compass. In his State of the Union speech just a few months ago, he talked about our collective shoulder that drives progress, as he put it. Obama has also talked about our collective salvation, our collective salvation. So our collective salvation, our collective shoulder, on behalf of pushing what he called redistributive change, on behalf of fundamental transformation, on behalf of social progress. Very different worldview. All right, so in conclusion, I gotta wrap up, I'm over, over my time. But I've provided you here, in the case of Reagan conservatism, you see this was both a social and an economic conservative, right? Reagan, Reagan was the complete. And in that speech at CPAC in February 1977, which I reprint in the, in the back of the book, think about this. What was February 1977? Gerald Ford had just lost to Jimmy Carter, right? After Ford had never won a presidential election. 
Nixon had resigned in disgrace. You had Watergate. We had left Vietnam. February 1977, February 6, 1977, Jimmy Carter had been president in two or three weeks. The Republican Party was being ripped apart by conservatives like Reagan fighting against the establishment, the pragmatists, the Rockefeller Republicans, the detente Knicks, who were telling them, keep those social issues out of there. I can't, keep, keep, keep away from that stuff. Reagan argued in February 1977, we need a politics of principle and a principled politics that combines both the social and the economic. Reagan said, embrace these values, articulate them well, communicate them effectively in a winsome, happy, cheerful manner, okay? Be not afraid of those principles, embrace them, and you will win and you'll bring them to the White House and you'll change the country. And then in 1980, Reagan campaigning on those principles won 44 out of 50 states against an incumbent president. In 1984, not running away from any of those things, talking about abortion, talking about pro-life, talking about family for four years when certain pragmatist advisors told him not to. Reagan ran for re-election in 1984, won 49 out of 50 states. Ronald Reagan, a Republican conservative, think about this, twice won California, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, twice and twice won Pennsylvania, twice won Pennsylvania. So, um, so don't tell me that it can't happen again. All right, thank you.